So thank you, Maria, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm privileged to be here tonight, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share with you a few reflections on interculturality and the consecrated life. Today, much is being written or said about interculturality, intercultural living, and intercultural communities. And this is particular, particularly true among religious congregations as they search today for intercultural life and mission. And I believe it is clear that central to interculturality is the encounter between the encounter with the culturally other, with the one culturally different from us. And so this evening, I'd like to share a reflection on what I feel is the theological or spiritual significance of interculturality or of our encounter with the culturally other. And this is that our encounter with the culturally other is an invitation to seek the other face of God. This insight comes from Mary Jo Leddy, founder of Romero House in Toronto, a residence for refugees and migrants. She entitles her little book, The Other Face of God, When the Stranger Calls Us Home. And so, allow me to begin by summarizing the main points of her book. Mary Jo says that it is an ancient biblical belief which the Hebrew people constantly recalled that God is not like us. God is always more than our thought of God more than what we make of God. Again and again, the prophets of the Old Testament reminded the people that God is not an idol, the work of our hands or imagination. God is always stranger and less familiar than we think. God is the totally other, the radically new. In other words, God always has another face. And this other face of God is revealed to us when we are faced by the one who is different from us, by the one who is other than us. And so it is when we come face to face with the culturally other that we get a glimpse of the other face of God. And this other face of God summons us to newness. As St. Augustine once wrote, God is nearer to me than I am to myself, but different enough to make me more than myself. And so the invitation of the culturally other is to reflect on the mystery that draws us from the familiar face of God to the other face of God, which summons us to become more than ourselves, to reflect on the mystery that moves us from our customary experience of God to an encounter with God who is different enough to call us to a different way of being. The mystery of how the culturally other, if we stay long enough with them, can lead us to a new sense of the nearness of God. And this capacity to see the other face of God is a particular need today where the general tendency is to enfold what is different into what is familiar. Generally, we are uncomfortable with the unfamiliar, with the unknown, and so we want to make the unknown known or the unfamiliar familiar. And the temptation is to create an image of God who is friendly and familiar, a God who is like us. And this becomes a domesticated, a manageable God, one who can be called upon for all kinds of personal and political solace. 
Such a God is thoroughly predictable and totally lacking in surprises. A God who can be called upon to guard us from those who are not like us, to protect us from strangers. Indeed, we live in a world where we fear strangers. Strangers are a threat to us, a danger to our security. And so we tell our children not to talk to strangers. But unless we allow them to face us, we will never see the other face of God. Unless we come face to face with them, we will never experience the about face so necessary for us to hear God's call to a different way of being and God's summons to become more than ourselves. <clears throat> I'd like to illustrate this point with a biblical story, namely the story of the stranger on the road to Emmaus. As the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke narrates it, toward the evening of the day of the resurrection, two disciples of Jesus were making their way from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And they were conversing about the things that had happened the previous days. Disappointment and discouragement were written large on their faces. They looked sad, the Gospel tells us. Their dreams were shattered, their hopes were crushed. Their master had died an ignominious death on the cross. After all, there was nothing to the great dreams of their teacher. Everything had failed. It was all finished. And so apparently they were going home, turning back to their former way of life. And then a stranger entered their lives. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And they welcomed the stranger and walked side by side with him on the road. And they allowed him to explain the scriptures to them. Two Israelites allowing a stranger, probably a non-Jew, to interpret the Hebrew scriptures to them. It's like Christians allowing a Muslim to explain the Christian Bible to us. Even then, their hearts began to burn within them. And they invited a stranger into their home and shared a meal with him. And it was at table when they were face to face with him that their eyes were opened and they recognized the master. They saw the other, the other face of Christ not the familiar face of the earthly Jesus, but the unfamiliar face of the risen Lord. Until now, they had not known the risen Lord. The unfamiliar face of the risen Lord. And that was when they made an about face. That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem and rejoined their companions. No, it had not ended. It was not finished, it had only just begun. A turn around from home in Emmaus to mission in Jerusalem and from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And all because they allow themselves to face and be faced by the stranger. All because they accepted to walk side by side the stranger and stayed long enough with him to eventually be face to face with the stranger. This is what the culturally other can do to us. The other can put us into contact with that part of ourselves, of reality and of God that we have not experienced before. And so with a stranger lies surprise, new possibilities. Many years ago, in a similar way, the eminent German theologian Rudolf Otto, in his 1917 book, The Idea of the Holy, spoke of God as mysterium tremendum et fascinans. In other words, a mystery that is both terrifying and fascinating, a mystery that both repels and attracts. 
We are comfortable. We are at ease with the mysterious fascinants. But we are uncomfortable. We are ill at ease with the mysterium tremendum, the unfamiliar, the mysterious face of God, the faith, <coughs> the face of God that emerges out of God's hiddenness. And so our usual tendency is to do away with mystery by trying to understand it with discursive philosophical theological language. Once understood, we can then file it away in a folder and archive it. And then we go on like business as usual, never bothering again about the mystery that we have understood or filed away, or better, never allowing the mystery to bother us again. And yet I think what the world today needs to see is not the familiar, customary face of God. The image of God that is very often created according to our own image. They hear about this every Sunday. They see this every homily. I believe that what the world needs to see today is the unfamiliar, mysterious face of God. The image of God that is beyond our ideas and imagination. Not the face of God that makes us complacent and comfortable but the face of God that challenges us and disturbs us. And so what we need today is not an evangelization that can explain away the mystery of God, but an evangelization that can lead people into the very mystery of God through the language of signs and symbols. In other words, what is needed in evangelization today is a mystagogic approach and language or what Pope Francis calls the mystagogic initiation or the mystagogical renewal of evangelization. What is needed is not only for people to understand the mystery of God, but for people to encounter the God of mystery. <clears throat> and that is what our encounter with the cultural, culturally other can demand of us, can demand of us, the courage to encounter the Mysterium Tremendum, allowing it to lead us beyond our customary self <coughs> <coughs> towards encountering our own unfamiliar selves. That the current interest in and search for intercultural communities is a veritable sign of our time. It is the spirit stirring in us, urging us to seek the other face of God and thereby show the world the other face of the church, the other face of theology, the other face of the consecrated life. And our present Holy Father, Pope Francis, is leading the way in this regard. First, the other face of the church, not the church in conservation mode, but in missionary mode. Not the church as an institution concerned only about, about its self-preservation, but a community in mission at the service of humanity. Not a bureaucratic institution, but as Pope Francis would put it, like a field hospital after a battle, where the wounds of humanity may be bandaged, cured, and healed. Not a church that is inward looking, busy with issues ad intra, but a church that is outward looking, concerned with affairs ad extra. To quote Pope Francis, we need to move from a pastoral ministry of mere conservation to a decidedly missionary pastoral ministry. Mere administration can no longer be enough. And so the Pope speaks against ecclesial introversion. And he says, all renewal in the church must have mission as its goal if it is not to fall prey into a kind of ecclesial introversion. <clears throat> in his other discourses, 
He refers to this as a self-referential church, a church whose identity and mission are defined in reference to itself rather than in reference to the world. Secondly, the other phase of theology. <coughs> Not just a theology that proves that faith in God is right and true, but a theology that shows that faith in God is beautiful and joyful. So not just a theology that employs the via rationis, or the way of the mind, but the via pulcritudinis, or the way of beauty. Not just a theology that answers the questions of the mind, but a theology that responds to the longings of the heart. Not just a theology that demonstrates the reasonability of faith, that faith is compatible with the demands of reason, but a theology that reveals the beauty of faith, that faith corresponds to the longings of the heart. And so not just a theology built on faith seeking to understand the mystery of God, but one that arises from faith seeking to experience the God of mystery. So not just credo ut intelligam, but credo ut sensiam, fides querens sensum, not just fides querens intellectum. Not just discursive language, the language of rationality, but mystagogic language, the language of mystery. The other phase of theology. <clears throat> and thirdly, the other phase of the consecrated life. Not the consecrated life which, in the words of Pope Francis, is identified with the practice of religious exercises, but one that is characterized by encounter with others, engagement with the world, and a passion for evangelization. Now the consecrated life where followers of Jesus are mere disciples, but where followers of Jesus are missionary disciples. Not the comfort and security of the religious house or convent, but the insecurity and discomfort of missionary service. Not the order entailed by monoculturality in consecrated life, but the disorder implied by interculturality in consecrated life. <clears throat> and so interculturality in consecrated life calls for accentuating its other face. On the one hand, sharing intercultural life among a culturally diverse membership is an invitation to seek the other face of God and an opportunity to deepen the mystic dimension of the consecrated life. And on the other hand, sharing intercultural life, intercultural mission among the poor and the marginalized is an invitation to view reality from the peripheries and an opportunity to deepen the prophetic dimension of the consecrated life. <clears throat> the other phase of the consecrated life. At this point, allow me to elaborate a little bit more on this other phase of the consecrated life. <clears throat> Some years ago, the German theologian Johannes Baptist Metz spoke about the evangelical councils as having both a mystic religious and a prophetic political dimension. This implies that fundamental to the consecrated life is the call to mysticism and prophecy. The mystical dimension of the evangelical council, councils refers to the profession by consecrated people of God as their only treasure their only love, their only freedom, poverty, chastity, obedience. 
It refers to the consecration to seek God alone and to love God above all. And this consecration is in turn rooted in the attraction to the mystery of God. <clears throat> While most people are ill at ease with mystery, mystics, on the other hand, are attracted by and at home with mystery. They sit with it, they contemplate it, they live it in such a way that it begins to manifest in their own lives. And the ineffability of mystery leads them to seek another language with which to, to speak about it. And often they can speak of it only in the language of signs and symbols, mystagogic language rather than discursive language. Mysticism is built on the conviction that God is not like us, that God always has another face, the unfamiliar, mysterious face of God, the face of God that is revealed to us when we come face to face with the one who is different from us, the poor, the stranger, the foreigner, refugee, the migrant, unwed mother, single parent, faith seeker, unbeliever, the non-Christian. And so mysticism begins not in the silence of our chapels or in the sacredness of our religious houses or in the comfort of our roots, but there where we encounter the ones who are different from us in the slums and barrios and inner city, the marketplace, the workplace, schools, hospitals, orphanages. And it leads us to the moment of contemplating the mystery of God, gazing at the, fa the other face of God, encountering the unknown and unfamiliar God. In doing so, we are summoned to newness. We are led out of our customary selves Gazing at God's face, we acquire the heart and the eyes of God so that we begin to gaze at the world with the eyes of God. And when we do so, we see the world differently. We view the world in a new way. Enemies become friends. Separating walls become open doors. Strangers become brothers or sisters. Borders become bridges. Diversity leads not to differences and conflict, but to harmony and unity. So mysticism, which begins with mission, leads back to mission. <coughs> On the other hand, On the other hand, the prophetic dimension of the evangelical councils refers to the solidarity implied by them with those for whom poverty, chastity, and obedience are not virtues, but imposed conditions of life. In other words, solidarity with the poor for whom poverty is not a virtue, but a condition in life. Solidarity with the marginalized for whom celibacy is not a virtue, but a social destiny aloneness, <coughs> solidarity with the oppressed for whom obedience is not a virtue but a sign of oppression. <coughs> As we know, there is a certain unreality to our religious vows, for they are attempts to live in the present the values of the future. In a certain sense, the evangelical councils are not yet real, that is why there are vows or promises. We vow to be poor, chaste, and obedient because we are not poor, chaste, and obedient. If we were, there would be no need to vow to be poor, chaste, and obedient. But there are those who by force and not by choice like us are actually poor, celibate, and obedient. The poor, the marginalized, and the oppressed and so one with those for whom poverty, celibacy, and oppression are realities and not just vows or promises, consecrated people can acquire a certain dose of reality in living out the evangelical counsel. To conclude then, interculturality in consecrated life is a call to the unknown, the unfamiliar, the new, in a certain sense, interculturality preserves the 
call to newness which the consecrated life is meant to embody. And so interculturality underlines the consecrated life's vocation to mysticism and prophecy. <coughs> the mysticism of gazing into the unknown, searching the horizon, recognizing even the little signs of God's presence. And the prophecy of pitching our tents at the crossroads of untrodden paths. Keep watch is the title of a letter of the Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life during the year of the Consecrated Life in 2016. I end with this quotation from the document. We are called to pitch our tents at the crossroads of untrodden paths. We are called to stand at a threshold like the prophet Elijah who made the geography of the periphery a source of revelation. The threshold is the place where the spirit groans aloud. There where we no longer know what to say, nor what to expect, but where the spirit knows the plans of God and hands them over to us. May we, missionary disciples of Jesus, respond boldly and creatively to the plans of God that the Spirit hands on to us at the threshold. Thank you.